This next song is calling you to come to Jesus.
Our next song says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. May God bless you as you listen. start the meeting. A very good evening everybody and a good evening to those of you who are watching us from your chalets. Hope that you've had a good day today and are here ready full of anticipation. I'd feel a little bit insecure if I started off a meeting without reading you a notice. So here goes. Many of you will know that the young people today have been raising money to provide permanent housing for street children in Guatemala. They're inviting us to join them in a brief candlelit vigil to pray for children around the world. So please support them and make your way to the food court at 9 p.m. tonight. And our book of the day is called Belief in Politics. And it's a series of interviews that Roy McCluffrey has undertaken with various people who are in the limelight in politics, looking at their beliefs and what they stand for. In the run-up, to the general election, it could be good for us to get a hold of this book and start to look at what different people are speaking out for in our nation. So do get a hold of this. Right, well, I want to wake us up this evening. I don't know if you're feeling as tired as I am tonight. And I want to wake us up with a few questions. Firstly, a factual one. Have a think about this. The coastline of Europe is longer than the coastline of Africa. 
Do you think this is true or false? Stand up if you think it's true. Okay, sit down, stand up if you think it's false. <laughs> and stand up if you just don't know. <laughs> well, it's actually true. The coastline of Europe is... <laughs> so, bad luck, Rob. You got it wrong. <laughs> uh, stand up if you think you've walked a ridiculously long way today. Probably about the length of the coastline of Europe and your feet are hurting. And stand up if you really wish you'd just stayed in bed. <laughs> Finally, another truthful statement. Wimbledon Football Club are the best team in the world. Stand up if you think that's true. And stand up if you think that's a load of rubbish. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Well, I just want to say that I hope you've come this evening with a sense of expectation and anticipation. Last night, around the camp, both in Rage in Rick's place and here in the Big Top last night, there was a real sense that God broke in, in a way that we didn't see in the first two nights. And we are praying this evening that God will be building on that and taking us a step further. We've got Wynne Lewis, speaking to us tonight, which is going to be a real privilege. But I want to ask us this evening to come straight into the presence of God. Don't wait around, come straight into his presence and open up your hearts to him for whatever he's got for us tonight. Thank you. Great, thanks Ruth. Why don't we all stand together? Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm reading the first 14 verses. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. This you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, don't be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Thanks be to God for his unchanging word. It's a fantastic joy and honor tonight for me to introduce our speaker, the Reverend Wynn Lewis. I first heard Wynn Lewis preaching 35 years ago. I was 14 years old at the time, and for those of you who are not good at maths, that makes me 33. <laughs> I thank God for Wynn. He is an evangelist. He is an entrepreneur. 
he's a, a pioneer. For me, he is an apostle, a father in the gospel, a church planter. As an Elim Pentecostal minister that I am, he invited me to join him on the board of Kensington Temple, where he was senior minister. And I witnessed firsthand signs of revival in Kensington Temple, where he took a congregation of hundreds and turned it into a congregation of thousands. He's a great man, a great friend. He's general superintendent of the Elim Pentecostal churches. So what George Carey is to the Church of England, he is to the Elim Pentecostal churches. And last but not least, like me, he's Welsh. So I want you to give a big, warm, enthusiastic Spring Harvest welcome to Wynne Lewis. Thank you, Wynne. You know, after that introduction, I wonder who in the world am I? I, I was preaching and, uh, by the way, I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm thrilled of the privilege of being with God's wonderful people. Uh, four Sundays ago, I was preaching in an Elim church, a very conservative Elim church in the valleys of Wales. And I just happened to mention in my sermon, uh, Balaam and Balak, how God said to Balaam, you cannot curse what I blessed. And uh, then after I finished preaching, they had communion service and uh, as is want in Wales, anybody can get up and say what they want, pray. And an old man got up and he says, Lord, he said, we do be glad to be in your house today. And we thank you for your word. It do have done our hearts the power of good. But we also thank you that you'll never have to speak to us through a donkey again. Amen. <laughs> so I soon knew who I was. Tonight, I have been given a subject to preach on. You know, I often wonder when the epistles of Paul were read in these churches, somebody scratching his head and thinking, what in the world does he mean by that? The apostle Peter found some of them difficult. And I wonder whether somebody stopped and said, hold on, say that again, and explain what he means. But in this passage tonight, there's no mystery. He says, if you stole before you became a Christian, don't steal again. If you were a fornicator before you became a Christian, you don't have sexual intercourse outside of marriage again. If you're married, you're married. And that's that. One, absolutely on the chin. In our papers on Wednesday, I cut out this quote. What are moral laws other than things to be broken? Now, it wasn't a preacher that said that. It was a woman who had just broken her marriage vows and had a sexual relationship with a married priest. And she went on with great profundity you don't have to be a good Christian, but you do have to love God. The vicar concerned added his comment about his mistress, she has great qualities of faith. Is it possible to love God without wanting to please him in everything? Is it possible to declare allegiance to him and behave as a heathen? A young lady whose boyfriend had broken up with her when he discovered that she had been sleeping with another man and another woman in a menage a trois said to her pastor, but what we have is so beautiful, how can it be wrong? Another young man who got involved with a married woman said to his pastor recently, I know that what I'm doing is wrong in your book, but I want to be so happy, and that's that. While pastoring in Kensington Temple for 11 years in London, I met many young people who had been brought up in a very, very strict Christian home and who moved to London to get away from family and church. 
They couldn't breathe with all the petty rules and regulations. How they should behave, dress, what friends they could have, rules and regulations, certain times they had to be in, mustn't attend X-rated films. And so they escaped to London when no one knew them so that they could live however they wanted. Now I had a measure of sympathy for those young people. I also was brought up in a very, very strict home and an extremely rigid mission hall in a little village. Even before becoming a Christian, in my late teens, every Sunday we were hammered. Sport is of the devil. No wonder the Welsh rugby team was diabolic. <laughs> From that pulpit, Sunday by Sunday, we young people were harangued. Bodily exercise profiteth little. And many a time I was literally beaten with a strap and a cane just for going to watch the village football team or cricket team. And within minutes of coming to faith in Jesus Christ, I was told publicly, now you can't go to the rugby, the football or the cricket. Nor can you go to the sleazy snooker hall. You are now a new creation. Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, thus saith the Lord. Well, I felt like running away. In fact, I did run away to try and breathe, to get away from these rules and regulations that I thought were God's. But I discovered they weren't. We are living today in a society where I'm reminded of Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right in his own eyes. Everyone feels at liberty to do what is right in his or her own eyes, even in the church. This generation has declared there are no moral absolutes. Existential philosophers have indoctrinated them to believe that truth and morality are completely relative and individually constructed. In the 50s and 60s, Christian moral absolutes were considered old-fashioned and obsolete. Nowadays, they are considered oppressive and violent. Recently, in a Pentecostal church, a classic Pentecostal church, the visiting preacher, in his sermon, said, it's all right for married men whose wife is heavy with child to go and have sexual relations with another woman. The resident pastor did not correct him. A recent evangelical survey revealed that a large number of Christian young people saw nothing wrong in experimenting with dangerous drugs, having sexual relations before marriage, living together without marriage, and viewing abortion as an acceptable form of contraception. In other words, even in the church, it's a free-for-all. We play the game of life and make up rules to suit ourselves as we go along. Imagine a soccer game tonight. Imagine Wimbledon with Vinnie Jones playing against uh, <laughs> any team with no rules, no referee to argue with, no touchline, no bylines, no fouls, just do whatever you feel like doing. Express yourself. Or a city with no speed limits, no traffic lights. If you feel like it, drive the wrong way up a one-way street. If you feel like it, imagine the chaos if everyone did as they pleased and felt like. Now, in this passage that Lyndon read to us so beautifully, God is saying to the Apostle Paul, there are house rules in my house. I'm linking up this passage with the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, 
nor your neighbors anything. God is declaring unequivocally, these ten commandments are my rules for living. Clear, unmistakable, unambiguous, pointed, categoric. There are certain things, God says, you are not to do, whether you feel like it or not, whether you're pressurized to do them or not, whether you have opportunity to do them or not, even if no one knows about it. He says you are not to murder, you are not to uh, commit adultery, you're not to steal, you're not to hurt your neighbor in any shape or form. If you believe in me, God says, there are standards of behavior. These are my house rules. They are not negotiable. There are no concessions. They are absolute. There's a great sadness in, in my heart that multitudes of people who claim to be born again believers evidence little or no change in their lives. In fact, the word born again now is so hackneyed, it doesn't mean what we think it means. And all these people don't live in Hollywood. Some of them live in our country. Their lifestyle after conversion is exactly the same as before. And indeed, if you said to them that there must be a radical change in their lives, their faith would be abandoned before their lifestyle. You remember in um, Abraham's pilgrimage from Ur of the Chaldees to the Promised Land, when his father could not dissuade him from lead, leaving, he joined him. And there's a lesson there. Beware of people who join you in your pilgrimage for reasons other than spiritual. And uh, the old man was quite content from Ur of the Chaldees down to Haran because <coughs> there was no change demanded in his lifestyle. There were a series of sophisticated societies, hotels, motels, his uh, menu was exactly the same as in Ur. His lifestyle was the same. But when he was two miles outside of Haran and saw the sign, Intercontinental Hotel, he knew this is the last bastion of civilization. And beyond that, it's living in the desert, in a tent. Tinned beans, spaghetti. And the flesh recoiled at the radical change that would be demanded, and suddenly he remembered an old war wound when they were fighting against the Iran. And uh, he said, let's stay for the weekend. There are good weekend rates in the intercontinental in Haran. And though they paused to refresh, they stayed to regret for 15 of the best years of Abraham's life. You see, the old man went along with him as long as there was no change demanded in his lifestyle. And I fear that many of us are like that in the church. We, we, we are happy to uh, have faith in God, provided we can still do exactly what we used to do. The old song... The things I used to do, I do them no more, is not applicable anymore. Because we can say the things I used to do, I still do them. Now in my youth, you could always spot a believer. They were dowdy, pasty, unattractive. Women with no decent hair, except that it was rolled up in a bun. Black stockings. Men... Oh, and no lipstick, that was Jezebel. <laughs> Men carrying a black hymn, hymn book under this arm and a black Bible under that arm and black looks on their face. No laughing on the Sabbath. I had my ear clipped many a time for whistling on the Sabbath. That is not the conformity nor the identity we seek tonight, my friends, in our Christian life. Thank God today that young Christian women are attractive. And you could put them up on the stage in Hollywood and they would outshine the lot of them. They're attractive, not only physically, but in spirit as well. And, and I certainly don't want to confuse cultural lifestyle with biblical holiness. Sunday by Sunday, I'm back in that little mission hall. Remove not the ancient landmarks. We were hammered. 
right, left, and center. Separation soon became isolationism, and you had no unsaved friends. We're not pleading for that kind of distinctive tonight, my dear friends. Mind you, we knew before we came to Christ what changes were expected of us when we did come to Christ. You know, within minutes of my conversion in my late teens, in the meeting, people gathered around me, the counselors, and their first words, instead of saying, now you belong to Jesus, their first words were, now you won't be able to play rugby anymore. You'll have to give up the cricket. You can't go to that sleazy snooker hall. And you wouldn't dare defile yourself in a dance hall. And no way could you go to the nearest cinema. They preached again every Sunday. What? See, they were old-fashioned uh, premillennialists. What if that rapture took place while you were in that flea pit? <laughs> Is that the separation from the world that Paul enjoins here? And like a sick person, live in a bubble protected from all germs, the germs of the contact with the world? What exactly does Paul mean when he says in Ephesians 4, 17, as a follower of the Lord, I order you to stop living like stupid, godless people. Their minds are in the dark, and they are stubborn and ignorant and have missed out on the life that comes from God. They don't have any feelings about what is right, and they do all kinds of indecent things. Now, there's the command from Paul. Don't live like the world. As a young Christian, I used to wonder why God was so much against leaven or yeast. You remember the story of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread? Before Israel left Egypt, they had to do spring cleaning. Get rid of of all leaven from your house, God said. There must be none in your bread. You don't carry any with you on your journey to freedom and your new life. I used to think, why did God say no leaven? Now, leaven, or yeast, is that which is kept back, a little kept back from last week's dough which permeated with yeast, allowing it to ferment and influence the next baking. Can you see that? God was saying, in the bread you take with you into your new life, once you step out of Egypt en route to the new life, I want nothing that is left over from the old life. Get rid of the old leaven, he says. I don't want it to influence and permeate and ferment your new life. Leaven had the power to influence and infect the new, just as sin. That which we still have as a residue from our old life, that which we tolerate, that which we nurse, that has a powerful influence infecting and influencing our new life in Christ Jesus. In fact, God desired that none of the cuisine of Egypt should flavor the taste buds of the redeemed. And he gave them a brand new, fat-free, cholesterol-free, slave-free diet, manna. But in Numbers chapter 11, we read that the people complained about their hardships, and the rabble who were with them began to crave the old menu. Oh, that we had the meat that we had in Egypt, and the fish, and the cucumbers. Cucumbers, they are deadly. I call them green devils because they have a devastating effect on me. And I was so thrilled to see this verse. It's from Egypt. And the leeks, let's skip over that. <laughs> and the onions and the garlic. Oh, that we had the old flavor. Do you have a taste for the old flavor tonight? Or does God's manner really satisfy you. Now, they said, 
We are being deprived of life-giving vitamins, the things that made our life so exciting in Egypt. They forgot the slavery and the bondage and the whippings and the beatings. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul is desperately concerned with the church's relaxed attitude to sexual sin within its borders. What had been powerful, uninhibited part of their pre-conversion lifestyle had been carried into the new life in Christ. And when you read 1 Corinthians 5, Paul makes a great play on these two couplets of words, the old batch and the new dough. He says, get rid of the old batch that you be a new dough for Jesus, a people without the bad influence of your past life. I did some study on fungi this week. Leaven is a fungi. It's part of the fungi family. And most fungi are poison. They are a group of plants devoid of the green coloring matter we call chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is nature's antiseptic. Chlorophyll is produced by photosynthesis, the influence of the sun's rays upon vegetation and our green grass contains a tremendous amount of chlorophyll and it's an antiseptic. Without it, we would be very vulnerable tonight to many, many more ills and woes than we are. And the absence of chlorophyll has a striking effect on the mode of life of the fungi since it's in its absence they are incapable of synthesizing carbohydrates and most fungi flourish in the dark. They don't, they don't fung function, they don't grow in the light. And you can well understand Paul's anger in Ephesians 5 verse 8. You used to be, he says, like people living in the dark. You used to be fungi. You used to have poison in your system. But now you are people of the light because you belong to the Lord. So act like people of the light and make your light shine. Don't take part in doing those worthless things that are done in the dark. Do you wonder why you backslide so easy? Do you wonder why you give in without much resistance to temptation? Because the chlorophyll, the antiseptic, the purifying element of the Holy Spirit cannot produce anything in the dark. You have to step out into the light. Or take the illustration in Genesis. When the flood had receded and the ark was resting on Ararat, after some days, Moses sent a raven out. And he came back and he sent him out again. And he didn't come back. And he sent a dove out, but it came back. And he sent him out again some days later. And by this time, the water had gone down more. And he came back with a freshly plucked olive leaf. Why did the raven stay out days before the dove? And I, I deduce that it's because as the waters were receding, there were the carcasses, the rotting carcasses of flesh. And the ravens pounced on the flesh, the rotting flesh. But the dove was a pure bird and did not and would not until the green stuff appeared. And many of us are like that. We pounce on the rottenness that is presented to us by the devil. But oh, that the Holy Spirit might work upon us in the light tonight and that we were able to discern between that which is building and which matures us and that which destroys us. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, Paul says to the Colossians, set your affections on things above and don't be controlled by your body. Kill every desire for the wrong kind of sex. Don't be immoral indecent or have evil thoughts now you must stop doing such things that's Paul not me Paul was unequivocal there are moral and ethical implications in the new birth he taught constantly and strongly that you and I do not have to and should not surrender to the desires and weaknesses of our humanity he placed much emphasis on the sanctity 
and permanence of marriage, its exclusivity, and that it was only to be solemnized between men and women. Whether we like it or not, he made it abundantly clear that he did not believe that true believers could be practicing homosexuals. Now, I know that this is not easy, and certainly I'm not preaching in a condemnatory way. It's time we came back to the Word of God. As evangelicals, we believe in the Word of God. Today's evangelical churches and we leaders need to give clear guidance and direction to our young people on these and other matters. It must come out very strongly on its belief in marriage and its, its opposition to cohabitation and trial marriages. We believe in the sanctity of marriage, and it's not a restriction on God's part. It is one of God's privileges and pleasures to us. Furthermore, through our example and teaching, we strongly affirm that when a person comes to genuine faith in Christ, it is a life-transforming faith. It is a belief that behaves. Now, we should be gentle, and we should be patient with young believers, and allow time for grace to work effectively in their new life. We mustn't become impatient and condemnatory, but at the same time, we must encourage young believers to have an openness to the Holy Spirit, to the Son that can produce that antiseptic that will give strength to, to resist temptation. This strong biblical emphasis should not make us a hard, indifferent, censorious, and judgmental people, especially to those who have not professed faith in Christ. Just because they step out of an adulterous association does not bring them into the kingdom of God. Just because a young couple stop having sexual intercourse outside of marriage, that doesn't make them believers. That's not the message of faith. These are kingdom standards for kingdom people. And we leaders in our preaching and teaching need to define once again the ancient landmarks, teach kingdom principles, and make abundantly clear the difference between that which builds Christian character and that which destroys. We must make sure that our teaching is not presented in such a way that people misunderstand the purpose and in so doing misunderstand God. The Christian life is not a series of negatives. I hear people saying, oh, since I came to Christ, I don't do the things I used to do. I don't go to the places I used to go. I don't say the things I used to say. And I say, well, what do you do? Where do you go? And what do you say? The Christian life is positive. We ought to be the best people on earth. People who profess faith in Christ should be the best neighbors, the most diligent and hardworking, sincere employees, excellent value for money, the most loyal of citizens, the most reliable friends, sincere, trustworthy, a credit to our Lord, the best advert for the faith. Nevertheless, young believers need to know God's house rules. Tim Keller wrote recently, the Christian gospel is that we are not saved by moral living, we are saved for moral living. We are saved by grace alone, but that grace will inevitably issue in a moral life. And as I've just said, we don't enjoin morality, as other systems say, in order to find God. Our gospel says we will live a moral life because God has found us. And Paul writing to Titus is very strong on this matter. The grace of God, he says, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, and it teaches us to say no. That dirty word, that word that's not popular today, the grace of God teaches us to say no to certain things and situations. And he says no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, 
and godly lives in this present age. This is not a day, dear friends, for our pulpits and our churches and our evangelical agencies to give an uncertain sound on moral issues. There are no gray areas in the gospel. There can be no compromising on these issues, however unpalatable they are. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, taught that kingdom people have to have a higher standard than tax collectors and pagans, and he invoked his followers to aim for perfection even as God is perfect. Sometimes, nowadays, Islam sets higher moral standards and places higher value on ethical behavior than the followers of Jesus. Paul, confronting the moral mess at Corinth, said, You are living like the non-Christian world. In fact, he said, you are worse. Even the Gentiles in their darkness would not do some of the things that you are doing. Your standard of behavior is provoking the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of Christ. We all deplore the double standards we've seen in American televangelists. We will never know the full extent of the damage caused by those. But what about some of the scandalous behavior in many of our churches, in many of our lives? Not only with regards to morals and ethics, but we say to governments and individuals, you'll never know real peace, whether you're red or blue. You'll never know lasting peace until you invite the Prince of Peace into your circle and life. Where is the peace in many of our churches tonight? Quarreling, arguing, disputing, hostility, hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness, refusing to speak to one another. The Prince of Peace, we say, is in our hearts, but we can't live with fellow believers. Where is the love, fellowship, acceptance, warmth, security in many of our assemblies? There's so much criticizing, backbiting, gossiping. How often do we pray for one another and encourage one another? When did we last phone a struggling young believer up and say, hey, I'm praying for you today? When did we last say to a hurt pastor, I'm praying for you? The scriptures invoke us to do so daily. Paul touches so many areas of Christian ethics in these passages, clear, straight, unambiguous. He says, stop lying, tell the truth. Don't boil over in anger, quit stealing, be honest, work hard, use your own credit cards, no more blue jokes, dirty talk, learn to say right things, clean humor, get rid of bitterness, don't be rude, be kind and merciful. Develop the same forgiving spirit as God has shown to you. Act like people of the light. Don't participate in shady deals. Now, God forbid, as I've said, that we should present the Christian life as a series of negatives. Nevertheless, Paul in Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5 says, these are the rules that kingdom people live by. And it costs to live up to these. I've known many a young man and young woman who disengaged from unbiblical sexual intercourse, disentangled from wrong relationships, and had to pay the price and stay single for the rest of their lives. It's costly. Now, this is not an easy, comfortable message, but it's necessary. Indeed, it's imperative in these days of sleaze. It's all right for political parties to say it doesn't matter about the candidate's personal life. But in the Christian church, it does matter. We have to be faithful. Our personal lives do matter because in the community, we are God's salt and light. We were made in God's image, Paul says here, ever striving in the power of the Holy Spirit to be as like him as possible and represent him in the best possible way. As I close, if I was to ask you a question tonight and ask myself the question, we've been saying, oh God, send revival. I stopped reading books about revival because 
I wasn't prepared enough to say, Lord, what changes need to be effected in me for you to do today what you did yesteryear? If the Lord was to ask you tonight, purge out the old leaven, purge out that old leaven that's carried on into your new life, what would it have to be? What association would you have to break tonight to live as God through Paul enjoins us to live here? Are there young people here tonight? And you know in your heart that what you're doing is wrong. It's no use praying for revival unless I'm prepared to get rid of the old leaven, to purge it out of my life and to be a new loaf for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Let's just pause in the quietness, shall we? And as we just bow our heads in prayer, let's remember something. That what we've heard tonight is what we would call unpopular preaching. It's just straight down the line. It's just straightforward biblical Christianity. What we had earlier tonight was a heart cry back to what we once knew. Lord, revive us again. What we've had subsequently is a clear statement of Bible truth. You want revival. Clean your act up first. What could be more consistent for us all? We've already had an appeal and made a response. We've already walked this tent and prayed. I just believe at this moment it would be appropriate for us quietly to stand together and to respond to what God has said. Let's stand. And I want you quietly in your heart to name before God this is not a group exercise in a seminar. I want you to name before God those things that you think should not be there and that God would want to get rid of. It's sober stuff. You're still allowed to play cricket, but some things are not allowed. And you and I know that we harbor them within ourselves. We all know what it means to have secret sins. Sometimes they come out years later, but they've had devastating consequences on our lives. Just name them quietly before God. <laughs> 